I'm going to read together this morning from Ephesians chapter 3. And if you have a, a Bible and want to turn with me there, um, please do so. Um, if not, don't worry, just, just listen as we, we read God's Word together. I'm going to read from Ephesians um, chapter 3 from verse 14 down to the end of the chapter. And it's a, a prayer that the Paul prays for the church in Ephesus. Ephesians 3, 14. For this reason I bow my knee before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your heart through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than we can ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. It's been said at times that the, the only way to get prayer in a church prayer meeting is to either be a missionary or else, instead of that, for you to be sick. And if you're one of those two things, somebody might possibly pray for you. Um, but apart from that, it's really hard to get anybody to, to pray for you. Now, I'm, I'm not sure, sure whether that's quite true or, or not, but um, sometimes it, it feels a little bit that way. And yet, when you go and you look into the Word of God and you read some of the prayers that you have in Scripture, what, what you find there is that most of the prayers you read in Scripture are for the, the, the growth and the building up of the church. As, as believers praying for, for each other, they may, may grow strong in Christ. Now, of course, alongside that, there, there are prayers, of course, for, for, for God's word to be proclaimed and, and for mission and people to be saved. But actually, the bulk of the prayers are for the church to, to grow strong and to be strengthened and to be faithful in their walk with God. And that's what you have here in Ephesians 3. You have really this threefold prayer that, that Paul prays for the church. And he prays that, that the church, the believers, that they would be strengthened by the Spirit. That they'd secondly be rooted and grounded in God's love. And thirdly, they'd be filled with the fullness of God. That, that threefold prayer, strengthened, rooted in love and filled with the fullness of of God. Now, in, in the first three chapters of, of Ephesians, Paul has emphasized just the, the solid foundation that we need to have. He's emphasized that the need to understand what it is to be saved by the grace of God, to, to know what that means, to, to have that, that living relationship with God in, in our lives and our hearts. And that, that foundation, that, that salvation that we have, it is for everyone who believes. It is for the Jews, it is for the, the Gentiles, all can be part of the family of God. It doesn't matter what the background is. It doesn't matter what, where you've come from. You, you come the same way through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ alone unto salvation, and you are welcomed into God's family. Paul has seen many people come to faith, many saved from, from both those backgrounds, from both Jewish backgrounds and, and Gentile backgrounds, He's, he's struck with this, the, the power of God to save. He's in, in reverence and awe and, and joy that, that, that people's lives are transformed by the Lord Jesus Christ. And he, he delights in that. And as, as he opens up the, this prayer, he says, This is the reason I bow my knee before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. As he bows his knee before the Father, he acknowledges that. that this, this whole family of God, no matter what the background is, all saved 
by Jesus Christ. And he prays for them that they would grow strong in their faith. They would continue on faithfully before their God. And so as he prays, he prays with, with, with passion. Note that we, we read here that he admits to, to bowing his knee to pray. He's on his knees. Now, that might not seem very significant to you, but when you think about it, most people in the early church, coming from a Jewish background, when they, they came to pray, they, they stood before people to pray. The only time they ever bowed, the only time they ever got on their knees, particularly, was if something was seriously wrong, there's a, there's a, there's a passion that was associated with, with kneeling. There was a, a, a crying out to God, often in tears, that was associated with kneeling. And, and this is how Paul describes his prayer. He says, I, I kneel before God. I, I throw myself before God. That, that there's a passion, there's a fervency, there's an expectation here that, that God can do a work in, in this church. That God can transform the lives of the believers in this church. That they, they can grow. That, that they can be strengthened. That they can be rooted in the love of God that they can know the fullness of God in their life and their heart. And it's with, with this fervency for spiritual growth that uh, Paul prays before God. The first thing that he prays for is that we would be strengthened by the Spirit. Verse 16, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, verse 17, so that Christ may dwell in your heart through faith. I encourage you to, to pray that, that prayer. Begin with that prayer. That God would strengthen you in your heart, that you would be more and more like the Lord Jesus Christ. Cry out to God that God would do that work in you, strengthen you through his spirit. It's not that these believers didn't have the Spirit. Of course they had the Spirit. The minute that they came to faith, the Holy Spirit was in their heart. I mean, Paul reminds them in chapter 1, verse 3, that they've already been blessed in Christ with every spiritual blessing, including the Holy Spirit. Verse 13 of chapter 1, he said that they've been sealed by the Holy Spirit. This is who they are. They are dwelt and sealed by the Spirit. They belong to Christ. The Holy Spirit is the proof of that in their life and their heart. And God's glorious grace of rich salvation is already theirs. But I do think there's a slight difference between having the Spirit and being strengthened by the Spirit. So I mean, to have the Spirit is to, to recognize that you're, you're, you're sinful and you're, you're a sinner and, and, and to feel guilty over sin. That's having the Spirit. Because somebody who's not saved, somebody who doesn't have the Holy Spirit, they have no thought about sin. But you as a believer know what it is to, to feel guilty when you do wrong things. That's to have the Spirit. But to be strengthened by the Spirit is to be brought to that place of, of repentance before God. Where you cry out to God for cleansing, for 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 God to do that work of forgiveness in your life and your heart. And when you cry out and you know that you're forgiven, you know that the peace of God, the forgiveness of God, i.e. the guilt goes because you've been forgiven. It's to be, to, to be strengthened by the Spirit. It's more than just realizing and then sitting with guilt. No, it's that guilt removed to that, that work of, of, the, of the Lord Jesus Christ through his Holy Spirit, showing you the, the, the guilt that you have Pointing your eyes again to Jesus, who's the one who, who forgives and cleanses, who died for your, your salvation. And, and you look to him afresh. And you know your forgiveness and the peace of God that comes from that. Strengthened by the Spirit. Having the Spirit means that, that you know that you are saved. You belong to God. But being strengthened by the Spirit means that you are actively growing in the word of God. You're studying it. You're spending time in it. You're learning from it. You're applying it to your life. You are 
You're learning what it is to obey God in, in those areas of your life, that particularly those difficult areas of your life. And God continues to, to grow you, being strengthened by the Spirit. The Spirit opens your eyes to see the truth of the Word of God and how it applies to, to your life, to my life. Having the Spirit means that we know that we should serve God. And there's the desire there to do something. But being strengthened by the Spirit means that we, we actively are using our gifts for the glory of God. We, we get up and we, we, we do something for him. And you know, in one sense, it doesn't matter what you do. Just do something for him. And I think sometimes in we we our men's Bible study in, in Craig Avon last week, we were talking about you know, God's will and God's guidance in our lives. And we, we came to the conclusion that actually, for, for a lot of times, we, we spend so much time overthinking what we should be doing for God that we do nothing, but instead just go and do something. Just, just, do, do, just act in some way. Use the gifts that God has given to you and do something for him. He doesn't remind really what you do. Just do something. And so... Being strengthened by the Spirit means that we, we are actively using those gifts for him. And as you begin to, to realize that, that the, the difference between having the Spirit and being strengthened by the Spirit, I think what it also means, and there's, there, there's a difference in how, how we live our life before God. We, we're, we're actively repenting, we're, we're actively studying, we're actively doing, we're actively using our, our gifts for God as we're strengthened by the Spirit, guided by the Spirit to, to do what God would have us do. And the result of that is that you grow, as, as Paul describes it here, you're strengthened by the Spirit that um, in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your heart through faith. What happens is that you become more and more like Christ. You're growing, you become more Christ-like. You're repenting of sin, you're becoming more Christ-like. You're fighting temptation early and you're obeying so you become more Christ-like. So Christ dwells more and more so in your heart, of course. I mean, literally, he doesn't dwell in your heart. The Holy Spirit dwells in your life. But um, that's what it looks like to everybody around you. They see Christ as you are strengthened by the Spirit. So make that your prayer. Lord, strengthen me by your spirit. Secondly, Paul goes on to pray that we'll be rooted and grounded in the love of God. As the spirit strengthens us, in verse 17, Paul goes on to pray that we're rooted and grounded in love. I mean, if you want to grow in the love of God, if you want to for people to, to, to see that, that that love of God flow from your life. Well, it, it begins by putting your, your roots down into the love of God, to, to know that love yourself, to build on, on that foundation. In, in understanding the, the greatness of, of God's love towards you, what, what it means is it, it humbles you. What it means is, is that the more you explore the depth of God's love, the, the more you realize how little actually you know of the love of God. I mean, we, we know what it is to, to, be, to be loved by a father. But to, to be loved by our heavenly father goes, goes far more beyond that. No, I, I know what it is to be loved by my, my father. Um, he, he passed away two years ago, sadly so he's not with us anymore, but he, he used to be so generous to us. Um, I mean, my dad would do anything for his family. Um, I often think back over the years, the times that, I mean, if, he, if you'd come and ask him for anything, he'd almost give it to you within reason. Um, his generosity was, was, was great when it comes to his family. Anybody else came in near him, he was a farmer, and they asked him for anything. If he was doing a deal with somebody on the farm, let me tell you, he took the last penny off them. Um, he wasn't quite as generous. If you came to him and said, look, let's do a deal, um, he'd go, no, no, the, the deal, deal has to be um, in his favour, um, not, not your favour. Um, we often joked uh, growing up over the years that only for my mum, my dad would not even have been as generous to the church as mum as, as, um, as and dad were. Um, you know, and uh, let me tell you, that's not a good quality, by the way. Uh, I'm not saying it's a good quality that he had in regard to that. Um, anybody came and asked him for anything, um, the answer usually would be no. If, 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 
his son or his daughter or his grandchildren came and asked for anything, the answer generally would have been, let's make it work. Let, let's do it. Um, and so that, that's my, my picture of, of a father. Generous, generous, generous to his family. Now, and that goes so far when it comes to see and, and understand something of the love of God. But then I, I read in Scripture, in, in Romans 5, that while we were still his enemies, Christ died for us. God the Father sends his Son, whom he loves dearly, to a cross to die in the place of people like you and me who are his enemies. Let me tell you, my dad would never have done that. Never. He would have protected his sons and his daughter and his grandchildren. But my heavenly father, that's his love. Let me say, it, 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 it's beyond comprehension. I mean, I'll be honest, I probably wouldn't do that either. But my heavenly father did. He allowed his son to die in the place of me, of you. Such is the love of God. And I've often said over the years that if you to take all the love of all the fathers that ever lived, of all the generations on this earth, and put all that love together, it would be like a drop in the ocean compared to the vastness and the extent of the amazing love of God the Father towards us. To, to understand the, the, this love, to understand that this grace that God has for us is the starting place to be rooted and grounded in love. This love of God that saves us and cleanses us and then puts his Holy Spirit in us so we are indwelt by him, equipped and empowered by him, guided and directed by him. This love that is not just for this lifetime but is for all of eternity. That, 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 that never ends. This love that, that is beyond comprehension. Listen to how, how Paul describes it here. Verse 17, you being rooted and grounded in love, verse 18, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. Paul says, understand this love that surpasses knowledge. Now, try and get your head around that for a moment. The love you're trying to understand surpasses knowledge. So, you know what? You're, you've got a, a job to do here to begin to understand the love of God because it surpasses knowledge. So what he's saying, understand the, the thing that, doesn't, that you cannot understand. Dig into it. Pray that God would give you an understanding here. This love of God that is broad enough for the salvation of all people of every background so that all can be saved when they come to the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. This love that is long enough to cover us and to keep us for the length of time that we have here on earth and for all of eternity. This love that is high enough to, to the rise to the very heights of your, your joys and your delights and your celebrations but this love that's also deep enough to reach even to the very depth of your discouragements and your despairs and even to cover us in the face of death itself. Such is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth of the love of God. And so we can surely echo Paul's words, it surpasses knowledge. And so we, we would pray, Lord, help me to grasp something more of the greatness of your love towards me, knowing that it surpasses knowledge. Therefore, it is going to take eternity to explore the infinite nature of God's love. Ephesians 2 verse 7, in the coming age, he might show us the immeasurable richness of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. In heaven, in the coming age, we're going to explore the depth of his love the richness of his love, the wonder of his love more and more. It's going to take eternity to explore the infinite nature of the Father's love towards us. But pray this way. Pray that you be strengthened by the Spirit. 
Pray that you be rooted and grounded in love. And then thirdly, pray that you be filled with the fullness of God. You know, surely as we pray for the Spirit's power, and we, we, we pray that we become more and more Christ-like, and that we pray that the love of God would be our foundation, we must therefore cry out that we would know more and more of God, the fullness of God in our life and our heart. I mean, we're not empty beggars anymore in this earth. No, we've been, been saved by God's grace. We, we, we've tasted something of, of his, his goodness and his grace and his love towards us. So we know a little bit about this already. We know something of our generous God. We know what it is to be part of his family already. We know what it is to have that, that knowledge in our heart that, that there is an eternity ahead of us that, that, that we, we can look forward to and because of the work of Christ and in saving us and, and cleansing and keeping us. But to be filled with, with the fullness of God. Paul says, continue to pray that for that. I, I think probably to use a couple of analogies here for you. We, we know at times what it is to be filled with other things in life. I mean, I mean to, to be filled with, with, with rage because you're angry. You know what that feels like. Where, where it takes over you. And, and, and you don't think straight and, and it basically controls and, and dominates your life. Or to be filled with happiness um, to such a point that you're, you're, you're so dominated by joy that, that all, you, all you can do is, is, is have a smile on your face. You know what that feels like. Or, or to be filled with, with, with grief so that, that, that all that you, you feel is sadness and heartache and, and pain. Again, you know what that feels like. To be so immersed in, in those things. We know those experiences. But Paul says, pray that you're strengthened by the Spirit, you're rooted and grounded in love, and that you're so dominated by God in your life, so immersed in God in your life, that you know the fullness of God, that the reality of God's presence with you. Paul says, get on your knees, like he did, and pray that, not just for yourself, but pray that for one another. Pray that for, for, the, for the church, for, for the fellowship. And here's why. I mean, Paul is committed to, to um, the church. He's, he's committed um, to the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, the reason that we, we can pray this way is because, verse 20, now to him who's able to do far more abundantly than all we can ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen. Paul says that the reason that you can pray this way is because God's already at work. Because you already have the power of God in dwelling you through his Holy Spirit. Because the riches of his glory already are yours through Jesus Christ. He's already at work in you. He listens to your prayers. He is powerful. And actually, his expectations are higher than yours are. In fact, our expectations of what God can do in our life are, are, are so limited compared to his expectations of what he can do in our life. He's able to, to, to transform us and there is no limit to his grace he is your, your heavenly father. And his desire is that you'd be strengthened, rooted in love, and you'd know him more and more and more, the fullness of God. Bill um, Bright of Campus Crusade tells the story of a famous oil field called the Yates Pool. It was originally owned by a sheep farmer in Texas by the name of Yates. And when Mr. Yates bought that field, he basically put all his money, everything he had um, into it and he took out a huge mortgage and I mean in, in those early days of farming he was getting so little money he, he was barely able to survive. He was relying on, on subsidies and, and government help so that he could keep on farming, put clothes um, on his, his children and, and food on his table and day after day he, he grazed those sheep on the hills in Texas and struggled to pay his bills. 
Then an oil company came in and did some tests, and they, they, they drilled some, some holes and, and some um, um, checks on his land to see if might there be any oil there. They, they, they drilled a test well, and they signed, they signed a lease with them. At 1,115 feet, they struck a huge oil reserve. The first well came up with 80,000 barrels a day. They, they dug two other wells, and they, they, they did even more oil than the first one that they dug. 30 years after it was discovered, the government tested one of the oil wells, and there was a potential fo fo flow of 125,000 barrels of oil a day. Mr. Yates, when he bought that land, he, he bought also the, the rights to the, the oil in the land. And for, for a lot of his early life, as he farmed that land, he was a, a multi-millionaire living in absolute poverty. He didn't realize what he, what he had. You know, as Paul says, pray. Be strengthened by the Spirit. Rooted and grounded in love. You may know the fullness of God in, in your life and your heart. You know God more and more. Become more and more Christ-like. And Paul says that God's expectations of this are even higher than yours are. Now, we're not talking about financial, sort of material stuff here. No, we're talking about something even more valuable. We're talking about that, that, the riches, the spiritual riches that are ours in Christ. <coughs> to, to know Christ, to, to, to have knowledge of, of, of eternity. To, to, to also to be, to be used by him to, to point others to, to the Lord Jesus Christ. That, 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 that grace that we need to do that that, that, that reservoir that we need to do that, I mean, it, it is endless. It, it doesn't run out, like those oiled wells. Or the image I often have in my head is, is of uh, the Niagara Falls and the, the volume of water coming over the Niagara Falls and just the, that, that, that uh, grace upon grace of God com that in comparison to the Niagara Falls. If you were to stand with a thimble in the Niagara Falls, such is our life compared to the, the, the volume of the grace of God that he, he pours into our life day after day after day. We take nothing will transform your life as believe more than this truth that God has eternal riches that are guaranteed by Jesus for your life so you can live as he would have you live, serve as he'd have you serve. You may be strengthened by his grace. You would be rooted and grounded in his love that you may know God more and more day after day. So Paul says pray. Pray that for yourself. Pray that for those people around you for this fellowship, for this church. Pray, Lord, strengthen me by your spirit. R root and ground me in your love. Fill me with the fullness of God. And do the same for those that I love, for the family of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Paul's prayer for the church in Ephesus. Lord, I, I pray this prayer for the church in Moloch Mean. They'd be strengthened by your spirit. They'd be rooted and grounded in your love. They, they would just know just the, the length and the breadth and the height and the depth of your love towards them in Christ Jesus. And they'd be filled with the fullness of God. They, they would just know just the, the, the grace of God over, overflowing in their life, the love of God overflowing in their life. They'd become more and more Christ-like. And in doing so, that you would use them. That those in this community around here would see the difference in their lives. And many would be drawn to Christ. Lord, we thank you that you are able to do exceedingly more than we can ask or think. Rejoice in who you are. Rejoice in your greatness. And we thank you that we can say, like many others, that we are part of your family. So, Lord, we pray. Apply your word to our hearts, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.